Today's session is about economic change, stuff that's going on in our world. What does this picture have to do with high gas prices? Well, if you're uh, at all familiar with naval history, you'll know that this boat is called a Chinese junk. And today we're going to talk about some other kind of Chinese junk. What about gas prices coming up over $4? We're looking at $5 gas prices by the end of this summer. And by the end of this, I think you'll understand that uh, we're getting what we asked for. We didn't even know it when we did, but we asked for $5 gallon gas. Hopefully we can answer some of these questions as well. Why are other countries experiencing economic growth and we're not? Pretty sure our politicians either don't know, or if they do know, they're not telling us. For the last 15 years or so, we've heard about this global economy and what it means to be a, a member of the global economy. Well, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that we've been conditioned to accept a flawed definition of what that means. The economy's been global since Columbus started shipping stuff back to Europe. What's happening today is not the growth of a global economy, but the shift of our American economic power overseas. I'm going to take a look at one example of how this affects us all every day. I'm going to look at the life and times of imported products from the other side of the world. It used to be we would buy what we bought because we wanted to buy something made in America, and we would buy it with pride. Not so much anymore. Now, uh, now I want to cheapen as cheap as I can get it. Why not? Everyone else does too, don't they? So what happened? Where's all that going? Where's it coming from? It's real simple. Let's take a look at the, uh, the process of that Chinese junk, where it comes from, where it goes to, and where we get it from. We can't get across that ocean by standing on the shore or staring at the water, so we're going to start by sending junk, recyclables. First, we move our junk across town to make a few extra bucks because, hey, who doesn't need a few extra bucks? So you load your stuff out of your house into your car, and you haul it down to the salvage yard. A lot of people are doing it. It's called being green. Well, as we're being green, we're getting a little bit of green, but we're going to see how much green we're actually giving up. We're spending gas to get there. And once you get there, you see all the gas and the diesel that gets burned moving that stuff around. Those scrapyards are busy. Some cities are busy 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we've dropped off our stuff at the scrapyard, and we headed off with a few bucks in our pocket. Maybe it's enough to cover the gas. That's the first time we move the junk. See if you can keep track of how many times this junk gets handled. Salvage yards are going to load their trucks and take it across town to the big distribution center, the big scrap yard, so it can get shipped out. So it's going to get handled here to go into the big truck and be hauled across town. That's the second move. These trucks are helping, helping us to buy cheap products. So they drive across town to the collection center. And that's move number three. Now it's been moved three times with gas or diesel. And at the big yard, they load it into a big shipping container. That's move number four. Then it goes to the shipyard staging area. That's move number five. And now we've moved it and loaded it onto the ship to go to the other side of the world. That's move number six. It's on the ship, and now it's moving. That's move number seven. Off we go. Take a look at what it takes to move that junk once it gets on the ship. That ship is moving at 25 to maybe 30 miles per hour. For a container ship to travel 30 miles, it's going to burn through 3,600 gallons of fuel. It's the same as burning 120 gallons of gas to go one mile in your car. There's 5,280 feet in a mile, so if 120 gallons is good for 5,280 feet, then one gallon is burned every 44 feet. Now, it's about 8,000 miles to China, so that comes out to 960,000 gallons of fuel oil firing up that big container ship. In my car, with 960,000 gallons of fuel, 
I could go almost 300 million miles, 288 million miles. Or I could go 78,904 miles every day for a year, or 1,600 miles per day for 50 years for one trip to China. Sounds like a really great way to go green, huh? 8,000 miles. Let's take a look at this map and what that means. 96,000 gallons of fuel. It's a pretty common trade route to go from the East Coast of the United States over to China. It takes about three to eight weeks, depending on the weather and if they're making any stops along the way. Oh, and by the way, every single mile of that route is protected by the United States Navy, which is paid for exclusively by, you guessed it, all that money we're saving by buying Chinese goods. So now we're there. We're in China, the other side of the world. Now we take the stuff off the ship. That's move number nine. Put it onto the truck. That's move number 10. And, you know, our politicians and business leaders are working so hard and close with our good friends, the Chinese, to make us new cheap junk. And, you know, they're looking at us and saying, yes, we love keeping you working with in America without jobs. The Chinese trade minister is saying they all think you guys are helping them. Yeah, if they only knew how much we make. Fair trade. It's okay. They'll never catch on. Good job. Keep the junk coming. Okay, move number 11. We're going to go to the recycling plant. Here's junk being sorted with steel, rubber, plastic, all these other things moving on, toxic items. Notice all the protective gear that these Chinese workers are allowed to wear while they're working. It gets loaded onto a truck and off to a plant where it's going to be melted down or recycled to be reused to make my new junk. That's the twelfth time it's been handled. Now it's in the warehouses, stacked away and ready to go. That's move number 13. Now it's time to make me a new toaster. So we go to this uh, state-of-the-art facility here in China where we're going to bang out the, the new toaster. These metal workers are highly trained and ready to build this toaster. Another fine Chinese plant brings in parts from all around. Plastic from one place, steel from another, copper from this guy, screw from that guy. That sounds real energy efficient too, doesn't it? So now my toaster's coming together. We got parts from all over China, and some of them even coming from the United States, or Canada, or Vietnam. There's too many moves to count there. You see the guy in the back in the top picture on the left, way in the back? Yeah, he's the guy that told you he owned the company. Unfortunately, he's lying to you because Americans can't own companies in communist China. All right, we finally got that toaster done, and it's ready to go. That's the 14th move. At the warehouse, containers, containers loaded to come back home, and it's loaded onto the truck to go down to the shipping port. That's the 15th time. There it's in the shipyard staging area. That's the 16th time. Now it's a toaster. This is number 17 times as it's being loaded on the ship. Now the container's on a ship, and it's time to be moving again. That's move number 18. And off we go, number 19. Now again, at that same speed, calling it about 30 knots per mile. This container ship is going to travel 30 miles using 3,600 gallons of fuel. Same math. It's a gallon for every 44 feet that that ship moves. Mind you, that ship on the left there is somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 feet long. Burns through, what, 25, 30 gallons just to travel its own length? Great way to save the world. Shipping costs add up to about 10% of every, excuse me, shipping adds about 10% every time a product is moved from one place to another, with diesel and gas costs being 35% of the shipping cost. The rest is labor and overhead. So that 16,000 mile round trip, we're talking about astronomical amounts of fuel.
Lots and lots of fuel. We'll talk about that whole lots and lots of fuel thing when we talk about supply and demand. So now we're back in the United States and we're going to offload the new toaster. That's move number 20. Goes to the customs yard, move number 21. Gets loaded into the yard waiting to be put into the distribution center. That's move number 22. Now it's loaded on a truck to go to the distrib distribution center. It's move number 23. There it is. Now here's one of those job killing, gas price raising. Oh, wait a minute. No, that's where we go to save all our money, right? Well, that's where we go to make them a lot of money and they live better. And as they're living better, we find ourselves with fewer and fewer jobs. So now we're going home with our toaster. It's the 24th time this pile of junk has been moved. If I'm lucky, my new toaster is going to work for a couple of months, and then I'll throw it in the back of my car and take it over to the recycling center, and we'll start this whole move over again. Now, keep in mind one thing when you're going to buy something from a communist country. Most of them are on the other side of the world. About 70% of what you pay is transportation. Moving our scrap from here to there not only costs time, money, jobs, and pollution, it's costing us the American way. 30 to 50% of the price is fuel and gas costs just to get you the product. So the moral of the story is, if you like high gas prices, buy from a communist country. See the whole supply and demand thing. Gas prices are high because demand for fuel is high. Now, this brings up the idea of corporate greed. People talk about that a lot. You know, it, prices wouldn't be so high and people wouldn't be so poor if it wasn't for those evil, greedy corporations. Well, let's take a look at this. The purpose of a business is to make a profit. That is the one goal that every business should share. Now, if making a profit is evil or wrong, then by definition, all business is evil or wrong. And the only answer to that definition of greed is either to wipe out all business and along with it all the jobs, food, energy, clothes, and other things we need to survive. Or we can try to find a more accurate definition of greed. Maybe we could attribute the greed where it belongs. Who's being greedy? Well, the scenario we just described is driven by greed. The American businessman who thinks he's enriching himself by dealing with communist countries is deceived. In the end, he's helping to destroy his own economy. And I suppose you can attribute greed to him. What about the people making the toasters? Well, the Chinese government makes money by those toasters. People themselves are barely surviving, especially if we compare them to what we've come to expect as a normal way of life. What about the shipping companies? Well, the truckers and container ship companies make a profit by moving their freight, but with a tremendous amount of competition in those industries, not one company is going to charge high rates and still get any business. So I, greed doesn't really affect them. That really only leaves the consumer. That's us, the guys buying the toasters. The reason the economy is hurting, the reason why we work harder to fall further behind, the reason there are more people and fewer jobs, and the reason why things like food and fuel keep getting more expensive. It's because consumers demand cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper prices. By demanding lower prices, we force producers to cut corners on consumer goods. And while they cost less to buy, they're also more expensive to own because they're inefficient and have to be replaced more often because, hey, it was cheap, it just broke. What about food and gas? The two prices most people complain about the most are food and gas. Unfortunately, there's no real way to cut corners on producing these, so the prices stay high. That's driven higher by the demand for fuel to make junk crowding the fuel market. Supply and demand. Farmers need energy to grow and fertilize crops. They have to pay the higher price for the fuel because there's less of it to go around. And then they have to ship that food to market. That's what drives up the cost of food. I hope this uh, brief presentation has given you a clearer picture of what it looks like to uh, be a part of the global economy. And uh, maybe next time you're looking to buy some consumer goods, you think about buying quality. Maybe you'll buy something that's made by your neighbor. 
instead of made by somebody on the other side of the world. The job you save may be your own.